Well, if you know who I am, uh, Bob Frischman, I've been organizing these for a while, and I'll be here for a couple of uh, presentations today and then introducing uh, folks tomorrow as well. Uh, you may also have noticed that we aren't providing uh, refreshments here, but we're in the heart of the city. If you're going to get thirsty or hungry, you should bring your own waters and food uh, from now on, uh, just so you know that uh, you won't find a, a bar in the back if you get thirsty later on. Um, and the format basically is uh, uh, this, uh, uh, traditionally there has been a meeting of the American section of the Antiquarian and Horological Society that accompanied the symposium in the past. And when this has been possible, we've done it, we've done it uh, a few times. And uh, Jim Sipra, who uh, heads the American section, is in California, is not well, so he couldn't be here. Uh, but uh, fortunate uh, is an official of that uh, American section as well, and at the end of this, there'll be a little one of their meetings, which you're welcome to attend as well. But the uh, uh, the wonderful extra benefit that we have here is that the uh, the, the head of the Antiquarian Knowledge Society in the UK is here, and uh, because it's an AHS event, he will moderate it. Uh, he'll uh, bring me back to do a little talk. He'll bring up uh, Mark McEnroney to speak about Redfern, and then he will also moderate our uh, our panel discussion about John Redfern. So we're going to try to wrap this up by four. If it's sooner, that's fine too, to give us chances to mingle. And then the official beginning of the official symposium will happen at five with my introduction of the James Arthur lecture for this evening. And I know that some of you are also joining us in the evening for uh, the Kalari dinner across the street. So, uh, and then tomorrow is all day. So, um, uh, it seems like everything is working fine so far. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, my fifth rodeo, I guess, of uh, doing these events. So mostly uh, things work pretty seamlessly. But also a huge thanks to uh, Nick Manousis, who uh, is the head of the executive director of the Horological Society of New York, uh, because he's made this so much easier for me because we're doing it essentially in his house and uh, he's been able to help so much with uh, a lot of the logistics, so that's been a wonderful opportunity. <coughs> so uh, I'll turn this over to James and I, uh, who will uh, uh, then introduce me, and then we'll, uh, we'll move through it, but he'll have some great things to say in advance. Thank you all for coming. There'll be more of you tonight, and uh, this is going to be a great weekend. Thanks. Well, Mr. Chair, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for that kind introduction. Uh, and indeed, thank you for the kind offer uh, to make my own introduction to this very special afternoon session, um, hosted and underwritten by my colleagues in the American section of the AHS, celebrating the life and work of John Redfern, master animator, horological educator. Now, I'm very conscious that we're going to hear some expert views uh, offered on John's work. And we're going to see some of his animations, which are extraordinary. And I don't want to steal any thunder uh, from my fellow panellists by, by dwelling on the details of his work ahead of time. Instead, he says, swerving off piste, I'm very grateful um, for the opportunity of talking a bit about the value of horological inquiry and scholarship, and the societies and the organisations that are so important to all of us in supporting our interest in this subject and in advancing our knowledge. And indeed, I hope it will be clear why the American section of the AHS is the sponsor of this session. So for those who haven't met me uh, before, I've chaired the AHS since 2015, assisted by a council of 11 others some of whom are with me here in New York, which is wonderful to see, and indeed we're going to hear from uh, Jonathan tomorrow, uh, one of the great collectors, Lord Harris, who was our founding president, uh, who forms a very important part of our history. The last time I met John Redfern, he very generously travelled down from Scotland to deliver one of our flagship London lectures, focused on some remarkable 17th century regulators by Joseph Nip, which are housed at the University of St Andrews. Now, we had to prepare really long and hard for that lecture, because John was very demanding. We had to ensure the processing power of the computer that we were going to use that evening. 
we had to ensure that the animations went well, that the amount of lumens generated by the projector were going to be sufficient, what the blackout was going to be like. It was quite a performance. Um, but it was necessary to have everything shown in its best light. And those painstaking efforts and that attention to detail on John's part were to ensure the highest standards in his presentation. That reflected an entire ethos. It was completely in line, though, with the ethos of our society as a whole, to try and present the very best, to present the most accurate, the most thought through, and the most tested research. John was really proud of his involvement in the AHS over many years, and he was very strong in his support, and I want to give you some idea why. Now, before I begin, it's obvious you know, that we are all here in the United States, with uh, you know, the rest of the weekend, an NAWCC event, organized in association with the Horological Society of New York. Now, I'm very proud indeed to be an NAWCC member. Indeed, I've been a life member for more than a quarter of a century. And the resources of the NAWCC are really important to me. You know, in my research, from, you know, being able to search back through digital copies of the bulletin, online as part of any research project. It's an amazing resource, alongside so many other vitally important things in the museum, in their educational effort, the library, the archive, so much more. But my NAWCC membership is just one of many really important tools in my toolkit for horological research. Now, I know that I'm largely speaking to the converted here, um, because there are I recognise there are a fair few fellow members of the society, so please forgive me if I'm telling you things that you already know. So please just, you know, let this wash over you. But there is a really important message that I would like to convey to the rest. Because there's a chance that you may be missing something that's, you know, really very, very valuable to you. When John wanted to research historical material related to a clock or a watch that he was animating and then perhaps lecturing about, he had access in the UK to a phenomenal store of digital assets hosted by the AHS. So for example, you know, there are all of the monthly issues of the Horological Journal from 1858 onwards. They're all there, they're all searchable, they're downloadable. And of course all of the issues of antiquarian horology from the founding of the Society of 53, they're all there, searchable, downloadable, particularly valuable for the watch crowd, for the vintage watch crowd in particular. There's the complete run of the watch and clock maker. And there's so much more if you delve. There are fire insurance records which can tell you details about the premises of the watch and clock maker that you're interested in from the early 18th century through to the mid 19th. There's fascinating evidence from historic court trials. There are searchable bibliographies. There are transcriptions of oral histories that we've conducted over many years, as well as recordings of all the more recent lectures. And there's a, essentially a huge library of searchable digital assets. Now, I'm astonished to discover that the Ancestry World Discovery option, which probably some of you subscribe to, you may, have, you may choose one of their other packages, but I think it's very common for people to choose the World Discovery option. Without any discounting, it's $40 a month. Now, with exchange rates as they are, international membership of the AHS is currently just under $80 for a whole year. It's basically free. <laughs> now, of course, on top of all of those digital assets, which you can access from anywhere in the world, anytime, you also receive a 144-page quarterly peer review journal in colour or decent paper. The editor for that can call on the assistance of over 80 independent researchers and reviewers, so all of our authors have a chance to benefit from the most knowledgeable people in the field in their final drafting. We aim to publish only the very best research. We also aim to publish new books. They don't come out very often, um, but we try as often as possible. One of the most recent of those books focused on an American topic. Um, that was Donald Sapp's amazing account of the Bond family of New England's contribution to clock design, astronomy, time distribution, much more. Uh, and by the way, that book 
uh, from celestial to terrestrial timekeeping is actually available through the NAWCC bookshop. You don't have to come to us internationally, it's available locally. So for more than 45 years, the NHS has had more, um, has, has had a very important section here in the United States, which Bob referred to. So out of the 1,600 members worldwide, 200 are based here in the United States. It's the most important community outside the UK by far. There are other ones, you know, Australia's important, Germany, the Netherlands, places you might expect. The US is by far the most important. Uh, so that group has always been large, and within that group, as I say, some 45 or so years ago, a section was formed here in the United States. Now, all of us involved in any activity of this sort, we're facing increased costs, all sorts of pressures. What would help the society vastly is to just basically double that group of 200 uh, US members to 400, which I think must be eminently doable. You know, you have an amazing community of particularly collectors of watches and clocks, but also lots of bench practitioners and craftspeople. You've got a whole community of collectors, scholars, researchers, uh, many more other characters across the nation. So you can help grow that American section to which I refer. Uh, it's you know, always been that large section, and we would really, well, I'm sure that they, uh, speaking on their behalf, would really welcome new members. It's probably true that there is not enough scholarship on American horology in our journal, and that is something that you know, all of you can help address. Um, so uh, we'd love help with that. Where are we heading? Well, we've got books currently in preparation. We have a program of digitization that will continue on into the future. We're working hard on cataloging and conserving a large archive assembled over many decades. We've only had a chance to deal with that properly since our move into new premises in London last year. So I warmly encourage any non-members in the room to join. You can do it with a few clicks on our website. I uh, arranged to ship over, um, and the HSNMI very kindly received and have looked after and just helped unpack uh, some material which is at the back. Um, there's a whole range of journals which, if you haven't seen them before, you are extremely welcome to take away. They're just free. Take any of the journals, they're here to, to, to go. Um, I also shipped over a box full of Ian White's uh, latest book, The Majesty of the Chinese Market Watch, because I thought that might appeal to some of the watch collectors. It's filled with both extraordinary history and illustrations of remarkably fine watches. So if you make that decision, you're going to make those two clicks on the website and join, be my guest. Take a book. You don't have to pay for it, just take a book. That has been, uh, my friends, a long excursion um, around uh, a society that I feel very passionately about. It shares a mission with the late John Redford to illuminate, to educate, to explore and to bring to light extraordinary things in horology, and I really warmly commend it to you. So coming back, therefore, um, to the hook for everything in this session, horological illustration in one way or another, can I perhaps now hand over um, to uh, Bob, uh, who introduced me, who's uh, going to ease us into a, a closer discussion uh, of John Renfern with a, with a survey um, of the field of horological illustration. Thank you very much for listening. Great, great overview, uh, thanks so much. Um, let's see, when my thing come up, uh, just tell me which button to press to advance the slides. Uh -huh. That's right. It's just it's amazing. <laughs> Isn't technology wonderful? <laughs> uh, thanks very much for this. I can say as, a, as an AHS member, uh, I second your uh, appeal for any of you who are not yet members to join it. I've actually given gift memberships to people because I felt it was important for, for more and more people to, uh, to know about the association in, in the UK and our brothers and sisters there and to, uh, and to see the wonderful publication that they produce quarterly, which uh, I've had the honor to be in in a minor way a few times, so I feel like that enhanced, uh, enhanced how I felt about myself too, uh, for all those reasons. Um, it seemed like um, 
an appropriate way to ease into John Redfern is to show what uh, what his predecessors were over the centuries, but certainly he was not the only one to illustrate uh, uh, horological material. Uh, mostly I wanted to focus on movements because that's what he did. You know, of course, there are millions of, uh, of illustrations of clocks themselves, and I'll brush on those, but we're mainly going to focus on, on, uh, on the more technical illustrations, too. So uh, this is my title slide, and I'll come back to that image soon. I mean, all of these are things that uh, I'd either like to hang on the wall or find the actual uh, a tool to uh, hang on the wall or play with at my bench. So uh, I think a lot of you know too that uh, one of my passions in horology is uh, horology and art, and I've uh, published, spoken, uh, lectured many times on that subject of, of essentially what are illustrations of uh, horology and art. But I come to that from a uh, from an artistic point of view, where I speak of the artist, the context, and the fact that there happens to be a clock or a watch in the image, as we see. Uh, of course, in this uh, circa 1450 uh, image, which is one of the earliest ones uh, showing mechanical timekeeping. Uh, fortunately, a few years ago, we had a great exhibit at the Grolier Club uh, where they were able to um, uh, uh, bring, bring books from a, uh, another great collection. And fortunate, uh, uh, as we are fellow Grolier Club members, which is a venerable old uh, association of book collectors based here in New York City, so they put on an exhibit, Fortunate provided a lot of the actual clocks and timepieces that were pictured in some of these ancient, uh, ancient publications. And this is a view of that, uh, uh, that exhibit and some of the uh, early, early uh, publications that were in that book, many of course which are full of horological illustration like this. So uh, again, uh, this, uh, this whole subject goes way back particularly when uh, perhaps uh, clock and watch makers weren't as literate as they are now, and maybe they needed to look at the pictures even more than, uh, than some of us now might need to. Uh, and there, uh, there is a great uh, catalog of that exhibit, which is available from the Grolier Club, uh, which is a wonderful uh, uh, compendium of very early horological material, which you can, uh, which you can learn about. So, uh, of course, we, uh, we, we go way back in, uh, uh, this again is, a, is another page from that catalog. So we go way back, of course, to uh, some of the earliest, earliest days. This uh, perhaps is uh, one of the earliest. This is a, a 1364 depiction of the Dundee clock. And uh, in case you've forgotten what that looks like, uh, that original clock is gone, of course, but recreations of it have been made, and that's a, a picture of the, of the real clock. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, a couple of you may have heard of that uh, artist. Uh, he had, of course, not only painted the Mona Lisa, but uh, uh, his, his notebooks and his, in his uh, traditional uh, mirror writing uh, described thousands of, uh, of technological uh, objects as well as his observations on almost everything in the world. So the, these are a few of Leonardo da Vinci's horological illustrations from, uh, uh, from the, the, the 1500s. Uh, 1495 we're looking at too. So there's a, uh, uh, again, uh, some of the, again, the earliest illustrations of, uh, of horological things, which da Vinci was interested in everything, so he was sketching this too, and perhaps thinking of new ways, uh, new ways to do things as well. I uh, point out this uh, one of the amazing books that John Roby has produced over the years, uh, because he also looked at that same da Vinci illustration and then uh, uh, numbered uh, and, and captioned uh, what we're looking at in that illustration, so that uh, it's a great help for uh, for those who wanted to study this more closely. So uh, I've. Been Partly, uh, I guess, to justify my membership in the Grolier Club, I have uh, accumulated a small number of early, uh, rare horological books in addition to the 900 uh, more mundane clock and watch books that I've collected, a bare shadow of what Fortuna uh, collected, but uh, I have big shoes to fill in that, uh, in that category. So uh, the first one that I can point at is uh, the 1741 book by uh, Tio, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, and we'll just look at a few of the plates that are in there. I was able to buy this book within the last couple of years, and a lot of these are big fold-out plates, so you'll see uh, the crease marks from where I laid them out and then uh, tried to photograph them uh, to give you an idea of what they are. So, you know, he's already indicating how sort of complicated and sophisticated the horological tooling was even in the 1700s, and this is even before the middle of the 1700s. 
So uh, I've dealt with this in other ways. So when I talked about early American clockmaking, where people uh, like to picture the, our clockmaker sitting there by candlelight with a Bowie knife and the, you know maybe a file or two, when uh, uh, they couldn't have produced anything like they produced without sophisticated tools and equipment like we're seeing here, including uh, gear cutting engines like we see here again, uh, uh, illustrated with uh, uh, in Tio's book. So again, more of the Again, complicated horological uh, machinery from that time. I love this one. That's uh, rarely do I see a human hand uh, hanging in there doing something, but uh, in this case, uh, in this case, that's what we're seeing. So, uh, in this case too, we're seeing uh, you know uh, lunar indication dials. We're seeing gear trains with fuses, all you know beautifully, uh, uh, beautifully crafted with uh, engraving tools and uh, and whatever they were drawing this with before it was. Uh, before they were engraved, so it's wonderful eye candy art that uh, that uh, are tr kind of treasures by themselves. And you see, we're we're getting pretty complicated. These are again 1741. We're looking at quarter striking racks and levers, uh, the kind that Jonathan Betts here, I'm sure, is fabricating every night by hand by candlelight. <laughs> but uh, we're seeing how this is uh, uh, again uh, complex, and these were wonderful things here. This is actually uh, you know, showing equation of time components of how how they were able to uh, do equation of time indications, uh, uh, and this is drawn out. So I guess, um, you know, unlike as uh, Wolfram was telling us this morning, how when they were in Nuremberg and Augsburg making these uh, um, masterpieces to prove that they could enter the guild, you know, I don't think they had drawings like this to uh, consult. They needed to learn from uh, from their masters if they were apprentices or journeymen. Uh, but once you get to the 1740s in that area, I'm still not sure you could just open this page and start making this yourself out of, uh, you know, with your Bowie knife. But uh, I think uh, uh, at least you had uh, a template to uh, understand how it worked and how you might want to begin undertaking it too. So this is uh, uh, the final uh, view from Tio showing a, a seconds pendulum and how he was uh, uh, setting it up to. Uh, uh, to, to examine how it works. So, again, quite sophisticated, quite uh, interesting visually as well as technologically important as well. Uh, for number two, uh, I was able to buy uh, one of his uh, books at a Christie sale some years ago. Uh, I thought by uh, putting in a bid below the low bid, I had no chance of buying it. Uh, and I was uh, both uh, alarmed and happy to find that I was the buyer. Uh, at an amount that scared me, but uh, anyway, I'm happy to have it now. And this book also has uh, also has fold out plates. We see uh, in the uh, IMH Museum in La Chaux de France in Switzerland, they have a copy of this book, uh, my book, uh, uh, open and showing some virtude material behind it. And uh, this is the book that focuses on marine timepieces, the virtude uh, uh, chronometers, essentially of the time. So this is uh, um, again one of the plates from that, showing his uh, gridiron uh, temperature compensation things. Again, we're seeing more of this, and again, beautiful, you know, amazing artwork, really, uh, illustrating the things that are in Bertude's, uh, uh, Bertude's book about uh, marine uh, technology. So there's a uh, kind of view of one of his marine clocks. So it wasn't uh, just John Harrison, uh, excuse me, UK folks, but uh, there were people in France also trying to navigate without ending up in Tahiti when they were trying to get to Fuji. So uh, it was, uh, a lot of the French were just as interested in marine timekeeping as, uh, as the English were as well. Uh, and here we see again another uh, extremely uh, complicated thing. Of course, you know, at a glance, I'm sure most of you understand what's happening here and can reproduce it, but uh, I, I, I'm challenged by it, of course. But what we're seeing is again the, uh, the temperature compensation uh, uh, systems he was trying to deal with in marine tech. So if you look at those crossbars and everything, uh, you can now see that here's an illustration of that movement with that uh, that compensation, uh, and this is uh, uh, this uh, this piece is from uh, 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 Sotheby's catalog as well. Uh, what I was starting to realize too is that there were actually artists, uh, draftspeople, engravers who made these things. So I started to look at the tiny little print in the corner of these plates to look for the name of the artist itself. So in this case, you see at the bottom there, there's uh, uh, Louis Jacques Poussier who uh, lived 1722 to 1799, and I found examples of other types of artwork he did. He wasn't just, uh, you know, straining his eyes at night uh, trying to draw the. Uh, Trying to illustrate uh, marine technology. This is uh, Diderot, of course. This is his 
uh, famous portrait by Fragonard. So uh, I'm sure we're all familiar with Diderot's encyclopedia, which has substantial uh, information about horology in it. We're going to look at just some plates from Diderot as well. So we'll see uh, how those things were being illustrated too in a, uh, in a, in a, in a wonderful way. And, you know, these are certainly pertinent today for any of us who are uh, looking and working on these things. These are the same kinds of things that we're seeing in, in old watches as well. So again, uh, that second pendulum illustration looks similar to what we saw before. So we're just uh, kind of finding more of these horological tools. And I know I'm going through this quickly. Certainly any of these that you want me to share the images of you with, I'm happy to do it. And we are recording this as we are recording all the lectures so you'll be able to uh, track back and look at these as well. I don't think we put John Redford to shame yet, but uh, we're, <laughs> we're showing that this uh, was done competently uh, even in the old days as well. So again, we're seeing uh, great illustrations of that. So once again, in a different book, in the Diderot book, we're seeing Goussier again uh, uh, noted there as the illustrator. And of course, uh, the Thomas, Thomas Mudge book that we're all familiar with, uh, there are certainly illustrations in there. Uh, that are important in the 1799 book. And again, I looked down in the corner and I saw the, uh, the Poss and Company uh, as the uh, engravers, and I happened to find a billhead uh, of theirs uh, showing that they were in business at that time, and obviously Mudge was one of, uh, uh, was one of their customers when they were producing illustrations for his 1799 book. So our next guy, sorry, he's a little small, uh, Thomas Reed. I was able to buy uh, that book as well, 1826. He's full of, uh, of similar illustrations too. We're looking, I guess, uh, this, we're out of uh, France again. We're back to England, and we're seeing uh, the things that he was illustrating, including uh, music. You see, he's even got the uh, the musical uh, notation below of what these uh, pin pin uh, insert drums, uh, the melodies they would produce on the nest of bells. Uh, we have uh, he, here he's illustrating Leroy's marine timekeeper, so he's uh, referencing back to French. Uh, uh, chronometry uh, in that case as well. And um, so here's a close up of that showing a great uh, crown wheel and verge, but we're, now again we're seeing the name of an artist in the corner. Uh, so uh, who's that? There's another, uh, another artist. So these are you know, signed, uh, signed materials. And uh, the fun thing here we see W.H. Lazar's. And not only did I look him up and find that he was illustrating many things like this, but also the first eight plates of the uh, Audubon Bird series were, uh, were produced, were engraved by Lazar's up in Edinburgh. And then I was told by an uh, Audubon collector that um, Lazar's staff went on strike and uh, he no longer was able to produce these. And that's when uh, Audubon said, you know, I can't wait for you to solve your labor problems. And he went down to London to Havel, which then produced uh, for 30 years uh, the Audubon prints. But uh, Lazar's was the first one to, uh, to, to uh, engrave and produce, and, and probably for better, because I think Havel was uh, far better for Audubon than uh, Lazarus would have been. So, uh, uh, let's see, oh yes, uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica, this is from one of the earliest ones, uh, played by Andrew Bell, who did a lot of the, uh, as one of the founders, did a lot of engravings. Uh, he died in 1809, so we have a few illustrations. J.P. Morgan, we spoke often about him uh, this morning at the Met because that's what we were looking at mostly was his, uh, uh, the, the things that he collected avidly and in large numbers and then many of which ended up there. So uh, here's two uh, uh, Compion watches that we saw at the Met and uh, this is the book that he spoke of which was a hand colored uh, giant catalog of the uh, of, uh, of the Morgan collection, which he produced. Uh, he, he made a limited, very small number of these that were hand colored, and then a facsimile was done about 40 years ago, which you can see which are in black and white. And this also tells you that the facsimile had photography in it, but the earliest ones in the deluxe edition, royal edition, were painted uh, by uh, Hyatt for this limited edition uh, uh, J.P. Morgan work. So uh, this is a page, uh, I'm sorry for the small size, but this is a page from the facsimile, which, is, which was in black and white. Uh, uh, and Fortunate uh, spent, uh, uh, I'm not sure how many uh, hours or days, uh, photographing one of the originals in color, and you can buy uh, a, a supplement to the black and white uh, replica, which has the same illustrations in color, so you're able to see them uh, the way they were in that hand-colored version of that catalog. 
uh, uh, to see them in all their glory, as we saw some fine examples today at the Met with uh, with Wolfram. So uh, certainly in America too, where you know they were uh, probably buildings full of engravers and line drawing guys slaving away at the American clock factory. So you know they were uh, able not only to make an image of Chauncey Jerome, but to make an image of one of his clocks as well. And the Trandu Lee books, which reproduce uh, the Connecticut clock catalogs from almost all of the makers back then. You know, they certainly uh, illustrated mostly the clocks, but they would have pages of illustrations of the movements as well. And these were certainly skilled, skillful, shaded, uh, you know, uh, dimensional-looking illustrations that were quite competent and informative as well. That accompanied most of what the pages were, where they're simply illustrating their clocks. And so this was all promotional advertise, uh, advertising material too. Something that I had, uh, which we're getting close to the present day, in was this um, Hamilton ship chronology. Uh, thing put out by the U.S. Navy uh, uh, just uh, not too many years ago. Uh, this is from 1948, the Navy Manual for dealing with the, uh, the Hamilton 21 that probably a lot of you are familiar with. If not, this is, uh, this is what they look like. And of course, this is where we were able to quickly uh, uh, mobilize and mass produce chronometers, which for the previous 150 years had been kind of painstakingly handmade and in single quantities, we were able to pump out a lot of them so as fast as the Germans were sinking boats uh, with chronometers on them, we were able to outfit those boat replacements with uh, with Hamilton 21s in many cases. And there's an illustration, so you know it's not all photography. Somebody at the contracted by the Navy was uh, drawing things too and shading them to give you uh, uh, lovely illustrations of of those uh, of those movements as well. And there's a, you know, a, a the diagram too of how they uh, of how they worked inside those Hamilton 21s. Henry Freed, who was hugely important to the horological site of New York, his uh, his bench is upstairs on the fifth floor. You can get some karma by standing near it, I'm sure. Uh, and certainly, uh, this is one of the first books that I got when I was uh, first learning how to break watches, and it was uh, very helpful to, uh, to to helpful with me in breaking them and then thinking I could fix them again. Uh, but there's an image of uh, the younger Henry Freed, where he's demonstrating to students uh, with, a, of course, a, with a large escapement model. And there's an illustration from that book where you know, he certainly, again, was illustrating in ways that were uh, extremely helpful to those of us who were trying to learn uh, watchmaking from a book. Uh, and I guess some people did it, even though uh, it seems like you need uh, Henry to be looking over your shoulder while you were snapping balance staffs and, uh, <laughs> and uh, exploding mainsprings in your attempts here. Um, there was a, another book uh, by Dick Swan. Uh, this is again from the 70s, and he's, uh, he uh, took hundreds of American movements and he did exploded diagrams of these and actually went through and did the like, keep counts and everything, you know, and all these, uh, you know, basic American movements that all look kind of the same to us, you know, they weren't. And if you needed to make a part or understand what was inside any of these basic standard uh, mantle clock or banjo clock movements, uh, Swan did it. I still feel guilty because a friend of mine bought the Swan book, which was fairly expensive, and then merely Xerox 10 copies for the rest of us. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure that uh, that wasn't what Mr. Swan intended, and I still feel guilty every time I look at my Xerox version of it, but uh, I've now made my public confession. And, uh, and I hope I receive absolution from you for, uh, for doing it this way. And of course, George Daniels, we know how important a horological illustrator he was, uh, although in this uh, early book I did, uh, by him. We see that in this, uh, was actually a Cresswell who did uh, an illustration in that early George Daniels book, but uh, when we got to the watchmaking book uh, uh, like this, certainly those illustrations in those books are, uh, are beautiful and wonderful and worthy of uh, framing by themselves. Uh, Steve Conover, so any of you who sort of again tried to learn uh, by yourself how to uh, fix a junky American uh, mantle clock, uh, he had you know all kinds of uh, uh, these uh, spiral bound books like this, uh, which gave you the step-by-step -step ability to learn how to do this if you had the patience, so he was important too. David Penny, you can't have a conversation about this, uh, biological illustration without mentioning him, and here he is uh, doing a talk at the Kiel 
uh, AHS uh, conference that I went to a few years ago in England and heard him give his talk, and there's another example of the type of superb horological illustrations uh, he does as well. So just in wrapping up, certainly, you know, the illustration is, is not dead. As some have said, it's, it's actually more effective than photography because you can emphasize things where photography just sort of tells you what's there. You know, this is artistry, which is what art does. It takes reality and enhances it or distorts it in a way that makes you uh, really get the message more clearly than just staring at a photograph of something. So there's one cover of, of the uh, AWCI or uh, AWCI magazine and another too. So and this is not uncommon for them to use horological illustrations on their covers. So now the reason why we're here is to honor John Redfern, and I will turn this over to Martin Conradi to do that. Thank you very much.